Welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. Hello everybody. Welcome to the podcast. I'm going to be doing a science podcast. I call it the five errors of the universe. So with most of these, I do a reading of an article that caught my attention, something that I enjoyed reading. This is from Big Think, as always. I'll put the link into the description when I publish the video or podcast. So the article is called, There are five errors in the universe's life cycle. Right now, we are in the second era. Astronomers find these five chapters to be a handy way of conceiving the universe's incredibly long lifespan by Robbie Berman. Some of the highlights were in the middle or thereabouts of the universe's Stelliferosis era. Stelliferos era. If you think there's a lot going on out there now, the first era's drama makes things these days look pretty calm. Scientists attempt to understand the past and present by bringing together the last couple of centuries' major schools of thought. If you're fortunate enough to get yourself beneath a clear sky in a dark place on a moonless night, a gorgeous spacecape of stars awaits. If you have binoculars and point them upward, you're treated to a mind-bogglingly dense backdrop of countless specks of light, absolutely everywhere stacked atop each other, burrowing outward and backwards through space and time. Such is the universe of the cosmological era we, which we live. It's called the Stelliferos Era, and there are four others. The Five Errors of the Universe There are many ways to consider and discuss the past, present, and future of the universe. But one in particular has caught the fancy of many astronomers. First published in the 1999 in their book, The Five Ages of the Universe, Inside the Physics of Eternity, Fred Adams and Gregory Laughlin divided the universe's life story into five eras. The Primordial Era, Stelliferos Era, Degenerate Era, Black Hole Era, Dark Era. The book was last updated according to current scientific understandings in 2013. It's worth noting that not everyone is a subscriber to the book structure. Popular astrophysics writer Ethan C. Siegel, for example, published an article on Medium last June called We Have Already Entered the Sixth and Final Era of Our Universe. Nonetheless, many astronomers find the quintet a useful way to discuss such an extraordinary vast amount of time. This is why I like this article. The Primordial Era This is where the universe begins, though what came before it and where it came from are currently still up for discussion. It begins at the Big Bang around 13.8 billion years ago. For the first little, and we mean very little bit of time, space-time and the laws of physics are thought not yet to have existed. That weird unknowable interval is the Planck Epoch that lasted for 10 to 44 seconds, or 10 million of a trillion of a trillion of a trillionth of a second. (laughs) Ooh, okay. Much of what we currently believe about the Planck Epoch era is theoretical, based largely on a hybrid of general relativity and quantum theories called quantum gravity, and it's all subject to revision. That having been said, Within a second after the Big Bang finished, Big Banging, inflation began. A sudden ballooning of the universe into 100 trillion trillion times its original size. Within minutes, the plasma began cooling, and subatomic particles began to form and stick together. In the 20 minutes after the Big Bang, atoms started forming in the super-hot, fusion-fired universe. Cooling proceeded apace leaving us with a universe containing mostly 75% hydrogen and 25% helium. 
similar to that we see in the sun today. Electrons gobbled up photons, leaving the universe opaque. That's crazy. About 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe had cooled enough that the first stable atoms capable of surviving began forming. With electrons thus occupied in atoms, photons were released as the background glow that astronomers detect today as cosmic background radiation. Inflation is believed to have happened due to the remarkable overall consistency astronomers measure in cosmic background radiation. Astronomer Phil Plate suggests that inflation was like pulling on a bed sheet suddenly, pulling the universe's energy smooth. The smaller irregularities that survived eventually enlarged, pulling in denser areas of the er, denser areas of energy that served as seeds for star formation. The gravity pulled in dark matter and matter that eventually coalesced into the first stars. The Stellar Feroz Era. The era we know as the age of stars in which most matter existing in the universe takes the form of stars and galaxies during this active period. A star is formed when a gas pocket becomes denser and denser until it and matter nearby collapse in on itself, producing enough heat to trigger a nuclear fusion in its core, the source of most of the universe's energy now. The first stars were immense, eventually exploding as supernovas, forming many more smaller stars. These coalesce thanks to gravity into galaxies. One axiom of the Stellar Feroz era is that the bigger the star, the more quickly it burns through its energy, and then it dies. Typically, in just a couple of million years, smaller stars that consume energy more slowly stay active longer. In any Event stars and galaxies are coming and going all the time in this era, burning out and colliding. Scientists predict that our Milky Way galaxy, for example, will crash into and combine with the neighboring Andromeda galaxy in about 4 billion years to form a new one astronomers are calling the Milkomedia galaxy. What? That sounds kind of strange. Andromeda. Milko Milkometer galaxy. All right, got four billion years to come up with a better name. <laughs> Our solar system may actually survive that merger amazingly, but don't get too complacent. About a billion years later, the sun will start running out of hydrogen and begin enlarging into its red giant face, eventually subsuming Earth and its companions before sh uh, shrinking down to a white dwarf star. He's the degenerate era. The Degenerate Era. <laughs> oh, she has a good album title for a band. Next up is the Degenerate Era, which will begin in about one quintillion years after the Big Bang and last until one duodecillion after it. This is the period during which the remains of stars we see today will dominate the universe. Where we look up will obscure assuredly be out of here long before then, we'd see a much darker sky with just a handful of dim pinpoints of light remaining. White dwarfs, brown dwarfs, and neutron stars. These degenerate stars are much cooler and less bright emitting than what we see up there now. Occasionally, star corpses will pair off into orbital death spirals that result in a brief flash of energy as they collide and their combined mass may become low wattage stars that will last for a little while in the cosmic timescale terms, but mostly the skies will be bereft of light in the visible spectrum. During this era, small brown dwarfs will wind up holding most of the available hydrogen, and black holes will grow and grow and grow, fed on stellar remains. With so little hydrogen around for the formation of new stars, the universe will grow duller and duller, colder and colder. And then the protons, having been around since the beginning of the universe, will start dying off, dissolving matter, leaving behind a universe of subatomic particles, unclaimed radiation, and black holes. The Black Hole Era For a considerable length of time, black holes will dominate the universe, pulling in what mass and energy still remain. Eventually, though, 
black holes evaporate, albeit super slowly, leaking small bits of their contents as they do. Plate estimates that a small black hole 50 times the mass of the sun would take about 10 to 68 years to dissipate. A massive one, as one followed by 92 zeros. Wow. When a black hole finally drips its last drop on a small pop of light occurs, letting out some of the only remaining energy in the universe. At that point, at 10 to 92, the universe will be pretty much history, containing only low energy, very weak subatomic particles, and photons. The Dark Era. You can sum this up pretty easily. Lights out forever. Tonight, if it's clear, maybe you want to step outside, take a nice deep breath, and look up. Grateful that we are where we are and when we are. In spite of all the day's hardships, we've got a serious amount of temporal elbow room here, far more than we need. So not to worry, and those stars aren't going anywhere for a long, long time. I love an article like this. It's a sobering reality, an understanding of the time scale. I just, I'm fascinated by these things, which is why I have my little science section. Nerd at heart in <laughs> most parts. And this could lead to what future innovation would look like. So we know our sun's going to die. It's going to merge with the other galaxy. Well, in these, in these, thousands of millions of years if we survive if we don't blow ourselves up blah 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 the innovations will be to move to another solar system to move to another part of the galaxy to eventually find a new universe or have we in that time in between have come up with innovations we can't dream of right now that we could survive in a dark era universe if we had a Dyson sphere or, you know, we create a little sun inside a dome, uh, you know, a ball, round ball type thing. And that Dyson sphere would be our like little mini galaxy. And somehow I guess we could figure out the physics and the, you get what I'm saying? We don't know. It's so mind boggling. Just the, vastness of space but that there will be a generation that looks up and doesn't see stars it's just uh you know sometimes you need a cold bucket of water thrown on you this is what you know you don't want to keep wishful thinking and um certain types of cognitive behavior which i would associate with things like religion or you know, these innovations don't happen if we're complacent and we know everything. Oh, yeah, God will save us. The rapture will come. Someone's Messiah is coming. We're chosen. Uh, just the hypocrisy and whatever is enough. But it stifles growth. It stifles critical thinking and innovation. Thankfully, it looks like the numbers are changing in this day and age. Although it's not easy. This pandemic thing, the political uh, circus in America all around the world, I still think we should have optimism and that these things are great um, theoretical visions of the future and how we could grasp what happened before, what's happening now, and what are going to be the next chapters in our lives if we get there. So I love articles like this. I would dive deeper there's plenty of links here. There's images. Uh, like I said, in the description, I'll put the link to the article. I think this is where the future philosophers and scientific discoveries will be if we get there. It's such a small chapter of life to picture. I'm grateful. I'm 49. I'm going to be 50. I'm so happy that I made it here. I didn't think I would. Maybe that's just uh, the things I've been through in my life, but I don't know. In 25 years, could there be breakthroughs and medical breakthroughs that would give me nanobots to let make me live at 76 years old for a good another chunk of life and keep that vitality? 
that could be possible. And if you keep multiplying things like that, what generation will be out there will be free of disease, colonizing other planets, coming up with innovations when we realize, oh, well, okay, well, our sun's going. Can okay, we go to another nearest star? And that's why all this space exploration is important to lay the groundwork for future generations that we can't imagine what it's going to be like. What awesome things will be in our future. And I believe we will get over these things. One of my recent kicks has been Star Trek and my dilemma with the new Star Trek and the old. The optimism of we will get past words hurting us and money and possessions and, you know, all these things, nationalism. I mean, is it my apartment that I should only care about or the people around me, my block? Is it my borough? Is it my city? And then it goes to my state. I'm lo- and then, oh, I'm connected to what they bought us of America. So now it's America. But hey, what about South or Canada? Are those now? Isn't it we are all on this planet? The biology and evolution of why we're not all the same skin color and we're diverse. These articles get that philosopher, that wonder, that explorer in me, wondering, hoping for a, a blueprint of the future that'll be there for generations to come. And articles like this really get me going. Hope you enjoy it. I'll talk to everybody next time. Stay safe.